Welcome and Happy New Year, everybody, to a whole new year of Dead Talk Live. And tonight, we are kicking the year off right with the Manson Brothers themselves, Chris Margettis and Mike Carey. Guys, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Hey, John. Good, man. How are man. you? Thank you so much for having us on again. Oh, man, I love talking to you guys. By the way, what do you think of that new promo? Huh? Oh. That new awesome. intro, uh, you know. The, 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 the really bad part about it is, the only bad thing is you see a guy like Keith David, right? And then yeah. all of a sudden you cut to Mike and I. And I'm sure your fans are like, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> I the good you. news is, though, this is the good news. Since you're having us on first, we're the first guests in the new year, right? Exactly. Well, everybody who's watching, it only gets up from here. It only gets better. So uh, your, your fans <laughs> will be happy. So. <laughs> you know, I have not done a show in three weeks, and that is the longest span that I have gone in almost three years. So I had a lot really? of free time for the holidays, and I've been an amateur video editor for 20 years now. So not being rushed or anything, I just sat back and I created that intro. I created some promos. It's funny how much you actually enjoy your job in creating when you're not pressured to do so, you know? <laughs> I, I yes. couldn't agree more. You know, when you yeah. don't have that rush or that, you know, deadline and you could just sit back and create, it's just phenomenal. So... You know, you guys. We have a saying. We have a, Chris and I have a saying, and it's never force a joke. And that's the same with creating anything. If you force it, it's going to be shit. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. It's going to be shit. Tough. Now, you guys are the stars of the Manson Brothers Midnight Zombie Massacre. Uh, the last time we spoke, it was before it premiered. The movie was named as uh, one of the top horror movies in 21 by JoeBlow.com. Congratulations on that. I mean, thank you. That is a great mention right there. And now was, you guys have your very good to us. And now you guys have your own YouTube show called The Manson Brothers Show. And <laughs> before we even go into talking about it, let's give viewers a little taste by just watching a little short clip. From your latest oh, episode, oh, where you guys break down the exorcist. So let's check this out. Anyway, Fendi, they find the statue of Pazuzu. And Pazuzu is only like this big. No, he's really big in the Middle East. From a size perspective? Or yeah, no, a... I think it's a big statue they uncover it. Or maybe it just looks that way. I don't know. Either way. I'm just going to throw this out there. Pazuzu shows up in a bunch of movies. He does? And a bunch of shit. What What is going on with Pazuzu? <laughs> oh, now, okay, that's, that's hysterical. <laughs> I love the interaction between you guys. Now, there's a... That got me thinking. In The Exorcist, the original movie, I don't think Pazuzu is actually named until the following movies. No, he's not. I don't think they don't yeah. mention him until the second one. Yeah. They do show the very Pazuzu-esque face, though, right? I mean, that's kind yeah, of Yeah, they, they show that. They show the of... effigy of him, yeah. but they don't they don't mention him by name. That doesn't come up till later. And of course, we see the statue in the beginning with uh Max von Sydow uh, mm -hmm. you know, looking at that really scary ass statue <laughs> and then that scene that you're talking about it's sort of like a controversial scene where we get that split second of Linda Blair's face sort of flipping to her, yeah. to Pazuzu. Oh, yeah, that real weird looking like that uh, with the white face with the dark yeah. under the eyes. And yeah, stuff. that's the Pazuzu yeah, that, that's, look. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's him or her or whoever yeah. it is. Whatever. Yeah, the so there's a statue Pazuzu pronoun of Pazuzu, is these days. and then there's an image of Pazuzu. It's two yeah. different things. I think. Exactly. Now, I don't know if you guys watched this show, but several years ago, there was a, a show called The Exorcist that hit TV. It lasted for Yeah, I auditioned for it. That was shot here in Chicago, actually. Really? Wow. Yes. Did you audition for Pazuzu? Was that who you auditioned for? They're going to paint no, your face white? No, I auditioned for Man with His Pants Down Around His Ankles, number three. <laughs> no wonder you did. I know why you didn't get that one. 
<laughs> but anyway, I'm watching this show, and you know, when it starts off, you're thinking they just took the Exorcist name and they're making something completely new and different. But halfway through the first season, I got so pumped up when I found out that Gina Davis's character was Reagan from the movie. Oh, oh I yeah. know that. I haven't seen the thing, so yeah, you guys. And that's a very it. cool angle. I never saw that myself, I but, I, but I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm there watching the show from my couch, and she's sitting in church. She's by going under a whole new name now, Angela or whatever. And she's telling her story to a priest, and she's like, my name is not Angela. My real name is actually Reagan. And that's Very that cool. jaw-dropping reveal <laughs> moment. Yeah. And it got me reveal, yeah. so pumped up. Uh, I mean, I was just excited. You guys should watch it. The first I season was all about Reagan's story, like to the present from the 70s to now and what her life has become like. And the second season follows a whole other family and what they're dealing with. And I was really upset. It was on Fox. I was really upset that Fox canceled it. You know what I mean? Well, let me tell you a little secret about Fox. <laughs> <I've been laughs> and cancellations. Lay on. <laughs> yeah. I've been on a number of Fox TV shows as an actor and Fox has a really bad habit of canceling things before they're able to like get a grip with an audience. Exactly. You know, some some shows take a little more time. You know, mm -hmm. like I'll give you a good example, like uh, Homeland or Game of Thrones. That took at least like half the season for me to sort of get invested in it. Absolutely. And I, there's a saying here: if if Fox produced Seinfeld, it would have been canceled the first season. That would have been it. <laughs> they don't give anything a chance at all. Yeah. Or as my wife likes to say, I've killed more TV shows here in Chicago than a power out. So. <laughs> and I don't know what it's you know what it what's going on with these studios. I mean, it's it feels like they have to produce a hit show in the first episode. And yeah. that's just not them. That's just not possible. I think it's know? I think it's I think it's like that a lot in the film in the film side too because I mean if right. you guys remember when we were kids, yeah. You know, and not even kids. I mean older Titanic ran for what? A year and a half. Yeah. Uh, Indiana Jones ran for you know multiple years. Those kind of things. Those movies ran forever and now you make all your money on the opening weekend and that's how they that's how they base the success of a film you know or or, or a failure which exactly I mean, well, if you pull if you pull back the focus on that a little bit that goes back to also the instant gratification that we have yeah, with everything yeah. these days you know whether it's amazon or, or food you know uh, doordash or what have you we want instant gratification well it's the same way with the studios they want instant gratification they want gangbusters right out the opening weekend but some things just aren't like that i mean we could name a bunch of welcome dead talk shows. live fans to three old guy old cranky guys complaining about things <laughs> yeah. nowadays but that is so true <laughs> what Mike kids is saying. With your rock and roll music and your dan fogelberg <laughs> but it's so true because even on social media they say you have to start off your video whether it's a clip or whatever by grabbing the audience in the first three seconds well, and I post a lot yeah. of videos, and I can tell you by looking at the the numbers afterwards, on a even a fade into black uh, shot with the first frame, is going to do horrible uh, compared to an explosion on the first right. frame. It's the well, if you watch thing. our show, we do the same thing, and we were and we were kind of told at the beginning, you know, we we always had this kind of introduction style thing, and then you go into the show, but. It came out like guys you need to explode with like 30 yeah. seconds or less and then we'll go to the you know to the intro and then we'll come back and you know it, it, it's how we do the show i don't know if i'd say we explode with it but you guys we'll have that whole wrestling very setup. punchy at the yeah. beginning with it i mean he yeah. does the intros and he's really punchy about them and that is attention grabbing i mean i don't know what else we could do yeah. aside from fire a gun off in here which would probably <laughs> deafen us but We'll try that next time. Uh, you know, but if you look at trailers, <laughs> the trailers are that way too. Mm -hmm. It's always a, a, a downbeat bass chord. Burr, 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 
and then a big explosion yep. and then a clip. It's all the same. It's the world the of the span of the scrolling feed. You know what I mean? You're scrolling, yeah. and unless Amen. something grabs you, you you lose them. You lose them. Yeah. Now I also think it's because Hollywood, the 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 movie industry in general treats the audience like the audience is idiots yeah right they do (laughs) so they've come up with this manufactured thing that oh if you don't do this you're not going to get a lot of viewers or whatever and i think that that's been a forced narrative right i think if you went back to the old way you would get just as many viewers they would learn to like let it breathe a little bit exactly and now i think i think a big part about i'm I'm sorry i just want to add on to what mike said i think a huge part of it especially in our world with horror films and things like that and everything you discussed, John, um, I think that's one of the best parts about the genre is that it, it's so tight knit between everybody that it gives projects time to breathe and catch their audience. And, and you don't necessarily see the, the, the immediate successes, uh, you know, it, it's word of mouth and, and it carries on. And I mean, you know, well, Mike and I've noticed that from, from doing some shows this year that the the crowds are, you know, they're slowly but surely building and hopefully that continues and, and it uh, it gives me great hope for for independent films, yeah. um, particularly in the horror genre, not just ours, but but to watch people talk and 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 have the things pick up steam and and create buzz like there used to be, you know, exactly. and, and uh, yeah. find some and, successes. And, and then you have people like James Cameron, where everything he touches is a billion dollar movie on the first weekend. I mean, yeah. the sequel to Avatar broke like a billion dollars in less than 10 days yeah. i'm like holy hey, god bless them <laughs> yeah i mean, wish it would happen to us but... i wish we had their catering budget to make a movie <laughs> yeah right <laughs> if we just had their catering budget we can yeah. make a 50 million dollar film seriously yeah <laughs> well i initially thought before the movie hit the screens i'm like you know what that we're like on to a whole new generation now because it's been so long since the first one came out I think this one is not going to do that well, but damn, if I was wrong, I mean, that thing is blowing up the theaters, blowing up the box office and God bless James Cameron. I don't know if he's like, has a voodoo doll or something at home, (laughs) made a deal. He does. It's working. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, Whatever, whatever acidicity bag he's got or whatever, it's working. So I saw, I I saw this, I saw it said recently, somebody, I can't remember who made the comment. Um, I look at projects like Avatar like this, and I haven't seen it, so I, I'm, I'm not disappointed. Neither have I. Neither have I. Yeah. You know, Hollywood isn't making movie stars anymore. They're they're making kind of franchise stars. Like like yeah. when you go and and listen, I love the Marvel universe as much as anybody, but you know, it's it's Thor more than it is Chris Hemsworth. It's it's uh, Captain America more than it is Chris Evans. It's the guys are they're they're more their characters now they're not they're not bankable to go do any project they want and make money exactly they're bankable as iron man you know but mm-hmm. but and, and i think that's a shame because one of the things i thought was the coolest thing about movies when i was a kid was was the great movie stars you mm-hmm. know the clint eastwoods and and um god i mean uh, even McQueen, even guys like john wayne Steve, yeah, yeah but, but i'll even Davis take it to, for that matter I'll even take it to like Jean-Claude Van Damme and guys like that yeah, who were just, well. they were money at the stuff that they did, you know, and, and was he a, was he a movie star like Jack Nicholson? No, but he was a bankable guy in an action movie. And you well, he wasn't an actor him. like Jack Nicholson, but he right. was a movie star. But yeah. it was going to be a good time no matter what. And that's one of the things I think has really been lost and, and is a shame is that you don't have that real, you know, I mean, Dwayne Johnson is kind of that way, but yeah. even with him, there's there's a little bit of an expectation of what you're going to see and and exactly um, it's the yeah, role he's more it's of the an role image but, than he like is you said yeah. you know, Thor, and that's fine yeah and i don't begrudge him that and god bless him because man i'd like yeah. to be doing yeah. what he's doing absolutely sure. absolutely now you guys in this latest episode of yours talk a little bit in depth about linda blair um mm-hmm. linda blair for me growing up uh i loved watching her on the screen of course she's going to forever be known for The Exorcist uh, and all the stories we heard surrounding her and how she got sick when she first watched it in the theaters and so on. But I want to mention to you guys two other films that Linda Blair did back in the 80s. And I don't know if you've seen them or not, but one of them was called Chained Heat. Okay. Yes. 
I have not seen it, but I've heard of it. No. <laughs> oh, oh, we got to do a show about that. <laughs> All right. Chained Heat, she co-stars with one of my guests, Sybil Danning. Okay. okay yeah. yeah. I know now, Sybil Danning. Sybil Danning was like a, 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 a sex. She's a femme fatale. Yeah, she was amazing. And talking to her. I mean, she is so, such an open woman, and say and she made quotes like, "the the female breast is a very beautiful thing," and I'm like, I agree with you. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <No. laughs> yeah, yeah. And and to hear her talk, Jack and, Mountain Howling too. Yeah, but she went on to say that when Chain Heat came out, the weight of promoting that film fell on her shoulders because li- there's a scene in the movie where there it's a prison movie it's a female prison movie where there's an assault that happens in the shower scene and we see Linda Blair topless and she felt so un- and Sybil shared with me she felt so uncomfortable filming that and was really embarrassed when the movie came out that Sybil had to do all the promoting she had to go to all the events to promote the film and it just goes to show you how times have changed and yeah. what life was like back in the 80s and the kind of mentality you had to have I mean, this movie uh you know sybil said linda blair was really ashamed of it i mean what are your thoughts on that mike and how things have changed and well, I think I, I like it better the old way where it was more like a road show, especially for the lower for the quote unquote B films, you know? Yeah. They would they would send these stars out on the road with a print and they would show up at a theater or whatever and, and you know, for the lower budget films, that's what it was. And I really think it was better that way. I really do. You don't have the when something took time to build across country right? You didn't have the instant media that we have now where, you know, like a good, another good example that is Halloween. Yeah. They released Halloween and it sort of went across the country before it really got its rubber on the road, mm-hmm. you know, and, and uh, it I was better that way. I, I would definitely would have loved to have done that with Manson Brothers. And actually we had discussed that at one point in time of Chris and I, of us going out you know, getting a venue, showing up there, people wouldn't know who the hell we were anyway. Doing, doing a Q&A, a a, right? Like doing a Q&A a type of thing? Yeah. Yeah, doing we a Q&A. Do we-, we do a little live bit in character, usually when we go to the horror conventions, and it goes over really well. You know, doing that kind of stuff. And just, you know, get a little goodwill, a little promotion. And I think a lot of that goes a long way. The problem today is your stuff gets lost mm-hmm. amid the myriad of other you know thousands of movies that come out we did get a little chance to do a bit of that when uh you know when the film released we we got to do a um like a drive-in festival one time yeah that was Uh, great we we had a premiere at at the legendary music box in chicago the famous independent film uh theater where we got to do a little bit of that and i think especially for mike and i you know that's really our wheelhouse we we love to interact with with you know, fans or even people that are just horror fans that exactly. don't know who in the hell we are. There's a lot of those out there too. Um, even you know, people just, that come up and like, "Hey, you guys suck," and we're like, "Great, yeah. thanks for coming out." Yeah, I mean, it's just it, it's it's nice to be able to talk with people who you know are like minded. We like the same stuff. We're the lucky guys that got to do it. Um, but it, but I I mean that would have been awesome for us because we love going out and interacting with with anybody yeah, who's around. We could have done that driving setup. You know, a thousand more times, I wouldn't yeah. have complained. I mean, it was that fantastic. was fantastic. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys just really enjoy listening to the fans, meeting them. And- oh. uh, I'll tell you, it's the best part. Man. Without best sounding, part. without sounding arrogant, we're the two most grateful guys in the world <laughs> for anyone that watches our show, watches the movie, reaches out and says, yeah. "Hey, I saw your movie. It really was fun." And da da da. Hey, I watched the show. Da- we love that. I mean, we are so happy to get feedback and we're ha- we interact with people all the time on, on uh, social media and, and whatever. And that's, that's really the worth doing it. Exactly. It's fun. It's actually been a fun part about the YouTube show too, because we do get a lot of responses and they're not all a hundred percent positive. <laughs> um, but we, we kind of, you know, we respond to everything and, it, and, exactly. and listen, if somebody tells us we suck, uh, that's okay. Not everybody's going to love it. You know, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm happy to hear the critiques and everything that yeah, goes my, on. My wife thinks we suck. 
It's it's interesting with the with the YouTube show because you know we're in character. We're not what you're seeing right now. I yeah. mean, it's it's we it's been quoted before that aren't we always in character? But you know no. we're not. <laughs> um, and, and so sometimes th- there's you know kind of that line where we have to say, hey man, you know this is Stone Manson talking about this, not Chris. Exactly. Um, but but yeah, it's I mean that is the absolute best part is getting to talk to people who who again love the genre. Uh, talk about other movies that we both like, right? I mean, yeah. like that's one of my favorite I mean, things or scenes fans. in the film. Yeah, yep. we are. I mean, that's that's been the best we're part. Fans. And we we like we we love talking to other people because they speak our language. I mean, yeah. we're all fans, or we exactly. wouldn't be sitting here, right? It's the it, same reason why I, John, I turn into your show to watch yeah. when people I know are on there we're and fans. I want to hear about things from the film, you know. I mean, that's I I find that to be one of my favorite takeaways from the entire last year came from from your show and it was you know we had been banning around uh the idea of being on a streaming service and you know to to us it felt like the place where movies go to die right where when it when it's free and that kind of thing and i was listening to um i can't remember his name he was from terrifier he play plays art the clown yeah Uh, and and he actually said yeah you know, their movie really picked up traction when they went to Netflix, when mm-hmm. when they went to the place where you wouldn't think that that would be it, because that got the most eyeballs on it. Exactly. And, you know, to me, that was a really eye opening moment. And and had I have not watched your show, you know, to see somebody in a film that I had watched, you know, I would have never found that out. I think yeah, that really cool turned things. our heads about that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Know. Right okay. now, as far as our movie is concerned. We're just trying to get exposure on it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as much it was on Tubi for a while, and I think it got a lot of play on Tubi, which was great. We'd love to go on Netflix, Netflix, if you're listening. Um, but we're happy. We're well, happy I've to, got some connections. I'll stand on the corner. Uh, there you go, John. There you go. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, but YouTube, what most people don't realize is what it's like the top video streaming platform, you know, really? more than yeah. Netflix and anything. Yeah. yeah. Billions yeah. of people tune in to YouTube, you know? The problem is there's so much out there. Exactly. Like, it's, it, we're still trying to figure out the, you know, the pitfalls of how to get in audience. Algorithms, algorithms. Right, algorithms. Getting found. Oh, it. my God. Yeah. You know, when I started this thing, uh, and I'm still learning how to tweak it here, tweak it there, just to build it up and keep yep. getting more viewers now going back to linda blair i've got a second movie <laughs> 80s right. this is an another 80s b low budget horror movie called hell night i don't oh, know yes. that movie love hell night i we're, love we're hell actually night. gonna do a show on that now, it's got a van patten in it right yeah did we talk yeah. about that on the show yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. from 1981 and for people who haven't heard about it it's a bunch of uh college uh, fraternity sorority kids pledging and they have to spend the night in this mansion that has a folklore around it about yep. a, a man who killed his family and the Garth brothers weren't that wasn't that their names uh, I think there were the Garth I, brothers I haven't I seen it so, for yeah. a while but I think it was like that and the thing about it was here's the funny thing about that film that came out during the slasher cycle yeah. of the 80s yeah. and I, before I had seen it I assumed it was another slasher movie which it's not <laughs> no. so if you have not seen this film watch it in fact uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good movie it really good one of yeah. our upcoming shows absolutely I love that film and that's just another film it came, it came out in 81 that's just ingrained as part of my childhood. Now, I want to play <laughs> another great. clip. I want to play another clip from uh, your show. And this is where, this is on you, Chris, where you're talking about Washington, D.C. It's not anything bad, but let's check it out. Anyway, Fendi, they find the statue of Pazuzu. And Pazuzu is only like this big. No, I think he's really big in the Middle East. From a size perspective? Or yeah, no, a... I think it's a big statue to uncover it. Or maybe it just looks that way. I don't know. Either way. I'm just going to throw this out there. Pazuzu shows up in a bunch of movies. He does? And a bunch of shit. What, what is going on with Pazuzu? All right. Uh, it got cut off there. But uh, going back to the whole uh, DC thing, Chris, you mentioned yes. that, um, you know, DC... It, you're right. It's just a political shit show. <laughs> well, uh, it's interesting. Again, that's Stone Manson speaking and yes. not Chris. However, no. uh, in defense of Stone Manson, Disclaimer. 
Uh, Chris was one time the best man in a wedding in Washington, D.C., and I tried to organize a bachelor party for, for this wedding, um, and I couldn't. Let's just say I couldn't find the appropriate places to go, uh, inappropriate, appropriate places to go for a bachelor party. And I remember being there the whole weekend and trying to find like, say, what's the best, you know, um, I don't know, let's say steakhouse in town or what's the best place to go for cocktails. And nobody could really come up with anything. And, no. and I and I came to this conclusion that while it's obviously known for politics and it's the hub of politics for the world, for God's sake, uh, it's just not known for a whole lot of other things. And like I said, the sports teams are all pretty bad. Um, uh, don't tell no that. one's really from there. Don't tell that to right? the Redskins fans or whatever no, they're know. called now. <laughs> yeah, the, the commanders. The commanders, yeah. yeah. The, the commanders. Um, the commanders. Yeah, everybody's a transplant, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So there's so there's not a lot of a lot of you know homegrown folks like Chicago. Um, hey, some yeah, of them people need them organs. Don't be banging on transplants. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's <laughs> well, you it, know, it, it's an interesting town. So I, I'm a transplant to uh, this area from New York City. I'm born and yeah. raised for 23 yep. years. I've been living in Northern Virginia now for 25 <laughs> years. And Mike, you said something interesting. You were talking about famous people from the uh, D.C. area. And you mentioned Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Yes. Now, yeah. I'm a huge you know, Foo Fighters fan. I love Dave Grohl. And that leads me to Dave Grohl's horror movie. Have you guys uh, yes. seen yes. Studio 666? I have, yes. yes. Okay, that is a horror comedy uh, directed by another one of my guests, BJ McDonald, and it's a horror comedy, okay? And it leads us to the next point. I think horror comedies and pulling off that balance is probably one of the trickiest things in making a horror film. All right. Agreed. I mean, Chris, what are some of the secrets to pulling off a good horror movie where you maintain the horror aspect, but yet add some light comedy to it as well? Um, well, I, I secrets would be if I was 100 percent convinced that we'd pulled it off. <laughs> but <laughs> but I feel like we, we did to a degree. You um, guys did a great I, job I, in Manson Brothers. Well, no, thank you very much. I think one of the things that that at least from our film it was really important was we wanted to make sure that when we did something that was comedic, it was it was comedic, mm-hmm. but that when we did something that was violent or action based or whatever, that that wasn't comedic, that that yeah. was a hundred percent as gory as we could make it or as action packed as we could make it. Um, and we and I think we tried to let the comedy be you know, like locker room, natural humor, you know, versus kind of, kind of punchline beat, yeah. you know, type of, type of comedy. So I feel like, I feel like that was at least for ours, a big part of it. I, I, I just saw another horror comedy movie that last week called um, bloody hell. It's an Australian one. And uh-huh. I feel like that one really pulled it off well too. Uh, because again, all the humor kind of happens with the guy talking to himself and the rest of it is just a nightmare scenario. Um, with a lot of violence. And so I, I think, I think, I think if you really, you know, if you want to go straight comedy with some horror, I think you set it up differently than, yeah. than the way we tried to do it. Um, you know, so I think there's a couple different routes you can take. And I, I feel like, you know, so, so basically, so basically like Mike, it's basically compartmentalizing the horror from the comedy and let them have their own place in the film. I, I think if, yeah, I mean, I'm trying hard to to get this out and explain it the way I think it in my head. But the way that I see it, and this is not with just with our film, but of other films I've seen that I've been able to pull off, and some of them unintentionally. There have been some very, very serious hardcore horror movies that I've had very funny moments in them, and I'll give you one. Mm-hmm. In the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, arguably... That's one of the greatest horror films, at least of the 70s. And yeah. it is not a comedy oh, yeah. by anyone's perspective, oh, right? Yeah. So there's a scene where the uh, the older guy, the older family member is coming home with the hitchhiker guy after Leatherface had cut the door apart and he's bitching at him. And he goes, look what your brother did to the door. I mean, that it's, it's hysterical. It's hysterical. And I think the trick is that the 
the actors in the scene have to play it a hundred percent straight yep. and not wacky. Yeah. No matter what their character is, they have to play that character and not like go off the reservation with the comedy. So that that way you have you have funny, like Chris said, and then when something serious happens, it's shocking. And uh, you know, we we tried to do a couple of those things in our film. We had something really funny happen, and then five seconds later, something where the audience goes, <gasps> yeah. and I yeah. love that particular part because every time I watch it with an audience and that happens, I go, oh, we got them, you know? Yeah. And and I think that's really the trick. And to, to create the comedy with the characters, not create the comedy with the situation. The characters in and of themselves are fun, right? Look yeah. at Reanimator. Look yeah. at at, uh, at I was actually going to mention that. Like, I consider yeah. Reanimator to be kind of a horror comedy, and, and part of it is because of the lunacy 100%. factor. You know, um, I think that's a perfect example. I mean, anybody would look at that and say, "Well, that's a horror movie, man." There's, there's, you know, fifty-five gallon buckets of blood in every single scene. But if you um, really take again, it to an extreme, it does kind of turn into a comedy. Absolutely. I'm going to tell you, yeah. Goodfellas is a moments. comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, not a horror good, movie, though. Goodfellas, Goodfellas is a comedy. I gar watch Goodfellas, and I challenge you not to find funny moments in that movie. Oh, absolutely, well, Joe Pesci. Uh, I mean, yeah. just the, the dialogue with De Niro and yeah. all the other Goodfellas. The term Karen was created from that movie. So, <laughs> exactly, you know. exactly. I oh, mean, Goodfellas go. is one of my favorite gangster movies of all that. time. Well, you know, one of the real quick, just to, to close on this one, when Chris and I started the process, when we decided we were going to do this, I called him up and I said, listen, I got an idea. Here's the thing. No matter how absurd the situations get in the film, we're going to play it straight. Yeah. Like hundred percent, even though our characters are funny, right? They're funny. He's funny because he's an alcoholic, degenerate gambler. <laughs> <laughs> and my character is funny because he's an idiot, but who doesn't we do know that it he's Spanish? Nature. We don't break the character, right? And yeah, I mean, not only so does he not know that, Spanish, he doesn't even know he doesn't even know what Spanish is. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. He doesn't know what Spanish is, and uh, I think that you have to approach it seriously. If you approach it seriously, then the comedy's way funnier. Yeah, it's not funny when we go. Okay, here comes the punchline, right? Bang! I think, the, I think then, they pulled that off with uh, Studio Six 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 because yeah. I didn't. No, I thought I, I liked it. I didn't feel like they played it for the comedy, but like um, they did. A good, the kills were outstanding. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. a couple of them were very comedic, which I thought was in a good way. I'm um, noticing. But I thought they did a really good job with it. Me too. I'm noticing a, an uptick in the amount of horror comedies coming out. Is that is that because there's a demand for them? I hope there is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, ours, to be quite honest, ours did not start off as a comedy. No. But but people read the script and would, were like, man, we were laughing our ass off. And we're like, seriously? Like, we would write some funny parts. I mean, even the and again, where the brothers scene, talking to each other. The opening but, scene where you go into the story with the father, you know, these uh, redneck trailer, <laughs> middle of the desert. Uh, well, that came after. Well, that, that, that actually, came yeah, after production. That, <laughs> believe it or not. We had to shoot that post, post-production. post because. So here's, first, here's some inside baseball. We, we yeah, had shot the all these. We had I mean, work. <laughs> Mike and I did like a half a day of still photography where – it's leading from the Mansons in their 20s all the way up. And then there's mug shots and there's paparazzi photos of us getting arrested and all this other stuff where it leads to the downfall. And Max called us, what, about a month after Max Martino, yeah, our director, yeah. after we shot. And he's like, it's just not working. What do we, you know, what do we do? And uh, God bless Mike. He, 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 he ripped off that scene and they shot it. We we decided to put it in a comic book world, you know, which kind of gave us an out to do whatever. Well, yeah. wait a minute, hang on, cool. hang on, hang on. In fairness, but, in fairness, that was Max's idea. Yes, it was. It was. Yeah. It was yeah. Max's idea for the comic book and the trailer park people. And I did write it, but it was. But Max, you banged that out that you banged idea. out the script really in, in no time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was hysterical. and a little secret. If anybody out there seen the movie Eli, Charlie oh, Shotwell. Yeah. From Eli, who's the the star, is our little kid in the beginning of the movie. Really? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> I knew that, but I've forgotten all about it. 
Yeah. That's another great movie right there, Eli. Yeah. And another great horror comedy that's recent as well that's on Shudder is called Deadstream, about a live streamer on YouTube who's willing to do anything. And the last thing he has not done yet on his bucket list is stay at a haunted house. So <laughs> you can imagine how wrong I'm sure that it's goes. Good. Uh, I had the. Uh, I want to watch that now. I'm gonna yeah. watch that when we're done. And that is becoming. I'll, I'll, very I'll popular. throw out. A, I'll throw out another uh, uh, option for people. There's one on. I think it's on Shutter called Yummy. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. These people oh, yeah. who go to this Eastern European hospital get plastic surgeries, uh -huh. and the people become zombies, and it is. It's it's awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, it's, we gotta yeah, check it's those worth, out. That's worth a watch. I don't know if I'd call yeah. it the comedy, but it's it has oh, some it's parts. it's got its comedic moments. But but of course, everybody watch them. I mean, Go there's see, Re Return of the Living Dead, and there's Fright Night, and be sure know, to watch the Manson Brothers Midnight Zombie awesome. Massacre before all of these suggestions. Absolutely. And then, yes. I mean, guys, yeah. your your guys's movie. It's a shameless plug. It's no, it's funny. <laughs> it's scary. It, there's so many moments in that film. Uh, the interactions between you two guys is what makes the film. And then all the other all stuff right. added in. Thank you. With the guy stuffing his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, big way. Let me give you another inside baseball about that particular character. So in the movie, that particular character is called Big Wang, and he's a uh -huh. professional wrestler with a great big wang. <laughs> but originally... Big Wang was a huge Asian guy, but yeah. we couldn't find a huge Asian actor to play the part. Oh my so God. We, we had yeah. to make him. So Max said, let's just make him a guy with a big Wang. So we we're like, okay. <laughs> and then the and, sock. Yeah. And Sean, Sean Dillingham, who plays the character is a, just a phenomenal actor. He's in a ton of yeah. stuff and he just pulled it off. Great stand-up comedian too. Uh, yeah. You know, one, one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on just very briefly and, and, uh, the YouTube show itself, I mean, th that was kind of the genesis of the YouTube show was when we got asked to do it. Um, you know, the guys at Joe Blow have been great to us and, and and they, you know, highly ranked our movie. And later on, as as we kind of developed a little relationship going forward, they, you know, asked us if we'd be interested in doing a show. But the one thing they wanted us to do was have it be in character. Yeah. Because they wanted that constant yeah, interaction yeah, i totally i mean it's skull you know to be the basis for it exactly. and, and it's been a lot of fun <laughs> exactly it's and great. it's fun seeing you guys you know in character in the last episode mike you're wearing the fez hat because of yeah, the middle east do in the middle east chris has one too but he forgot to I bring do. it i forgot it <laughs> my son uses it to keep all his uh his um uh uh not credit cards, but uh, gift cards in it. So I couldn't take it from it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're out of time. I want to thank you guys so much. I can't believe we're almost into 40 minutes. The movie, guys, <laughs> is called The Manson Brothers Midnight Zombie Massacre. Where is it streaming exactly right now? Uh, it's, I think it's still on Tubi, Amazon. but you can get it on Amazon or, yeah. or uh, all the major uh, TV anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, on, it's on YouTube, Amazon, iTunes. Voodoo, Redbox, IMDb, awesome. uh, video on demand everywhere. And you can purchase the Blu-ray or DVD off of Amazon. Or if you get it off our website, we'll sign it for you. Nice. Yeah, we'll sign it for you. Nice. And new shows of the of the Manson Brothers show come out every Monday on the Arrow and the Head Show Network on YouTube. Um, so everybody join us. Send us emails. We'd love to answer questions. Please give uh, us a like. Have a blast. Subscribe to the yeah. channel. Yeah, subscribe to the show. Watch it. They're in character. So it's like every Monday you're getting another part of the Manson Brothers. So definitely check <laughs> it out. you like it or not. <laughs> I want to thank my, my guests, the Manson Brothers, Chris Margettis and Mike Carey. Uh, thank you to the audience, those of you who are tuning in live, and those of you who will be watching this later on. Uh, 2023 is off to a great, great start. Until tomorrow, stay safe. And on behalf of all of us, stay walking. Good night, everybody.